It's been some time since I did an extreme redline restoration video. A subscriber sent me this bifocal a couple months back to see if I could salvage it. It's seen better times to say the least. Besides being partially crushed, someone must have found out about how pink red lines are worth more and decided to make one of their own. Let's take it apart and get a better look. Not much in this car is in good shape. It's missing its plastic hood, which is very common as they were easy to pull off. The plastic windshield is shattered due to someone, I would guess, stepping on the car and crushing the roof, pushing the windshield into the internal plastic, crushing it. The body is completely pitted and I can't tell from the outside what the original color was. On the positive side, the car still has both of its front pillars, even though the roof is bent in. Looking on the inside of the body, I can only guess at the original color. Maybe a lime green? It's really hard to say as this car has almost no original paint on it. The first thing I'll need to do is fix the roof. I do this first because if I ruin the car at this point, then I really haven't wasted any time or resources. This is a 1971 car, and in that year Mattel had several bad batches of Zamac metal. The cars made with this metal disintegrate over the years, and collectors call them crumblers. This car does not appear to be a crumbler, but when I start beating on it, there's always a chance that something breaks instead of bends. To bend the roof back out, I'll employ a block of pine and a ball-peen hammer. I'll use the peen side of the hammer along with a small plastic mallet to slowly bend the roof back into shape. Luckily nothing broke when I was bending the roof, so I can move on to removing the pink paint. I'm unsure what type of paint the child used, so I'll first try to remove it with my aircraft paint remover. The paint remover had no trouble removing the paint on the body. However, the engine was another story. I first started using some picks to remove the paint, but then had to move to some actual dental picks to get into some of the more difficult areas. It took some time, but I was able to remove all the pink paint from the engine. Here's what the body looks like after all the paint was removed. Looking it over, there is quite a lot of oxidation and pitting. I'll go ahead and remove the oxidation with the electro-polishing setup, link below if you're interested in that. After the oxidation was removed, the pitting really stands out, especially in the rear of the car. I wasn't sure at this point if I was actually going to be able to restore this car, but I decided to carry on and see what could be done. So I began sanding with 600 grit sandpaper. Sanding will remove a lot of the smaller pits, but not the larger ones. There always seems to be some confusion about filling the pits, with people recommending filling them with all sorts of paste and fillers. The problem is that the paint is transparent, so any fillers I use will make the pits stand out once it's painted. Others talk about filling the pits with some type of metal solder. In my experience, I've never been able to solder on these cars. The solder doesn't stick no matter how much flux I use. I've even tried expensive low temp solders with no success. If you know for sure a way to solder these cars, then please contact me below. You can see here how the body looked after several hours of sanding. I started to feel much more positive about this car, so I decided to go ahead and move on to zinc plating the metal. I'll leave a link below to this process. The zinc plating will add a small amount of metal to the car's surface. This metal will protect the underlying metal and more importantly give the car body a uniform brightness when I polish it later. After about two hours of plating, I'll remove the car, wash it, and allow it to dry. The deposit of zinc needs to be lightly sanded. To do this, I use some triple lot steel wool to remove the upper layer of zinc and shine it up a bit. Once all the hazy metal is removed, I go straight into polishing it with a polishing wheel on a Dremel and some metal polish. So at this point, the body is zinc plated and polished and looks relatively good compared to what we started with. Now I need to decide on a color. The subscriber that sent this to me was kind enough to give it to me so I can choose whatever color I want. Looking at the red line Bible to see what colors the car was originally painted, I immediately decide on the magenta given the car on the top of the page. This car was never painted pink, but magenta is very close to pink so I can pay tribute to the child that originally customized this car. By the way, this book is available on Amazon and I'll leave a link below, but be prepared for some major sticker shock. Unlike cars I've done in the past, I'll need to cover the engine with some masking tape this time. See my guide on Redline Restorations video if you'd like to watch me paint a car. This car took about five coats and I let it cure for about a day before I touched it. Now that it's painted, I need to add on the decals. 
I bought the decals along with the windshield and plastic hood from a shop on eBay that specializes in redline reproduction parts. I was not able to find the original hood and windshield for this car, so reproductions are the only way to go. Here's the card from the individual who runs the shop. I was not asked to mention it, but I've used enough items from this person to highly recommend them. To put the decals on, I'll need some water, a small paintbrush, and some micro solution. The micro solution will be used later, but it softens the decal and sort of dissolves it onto the body. The end result is that you can't tell where the decal begins, and thus it looks like it was painted on. The first thing I do is place the decal in water for a few minutes. Next I'll wet the area where the decal will go, and then I'll fish the decal out of the water with the paintbrush. I then place it on the car body, and using the brush slide the decal off the paper and onto the body of the car. Afterwards I'll use the brush to move the decal into place. Once it's in place, I'll let it dry for a few minutes and then come back with the micro solution on top. If done correctly, there will be no air bubbles in the decal. If there are air bubbles, then you can pop them with a sharp pointed object, I like to use an old airbrush needle, and then reapply the micro solution and it will remove the bubble. Once the decals are applied and are fully dried, I can protect them by applying a clear coat. Here I use a urethane clear coat or a clear spectroflame paint I purchased from the Redline shop. This will bury the decal under the paint and give it a nice glossy shine. With the body done, I can now turn my attention to the base. And wow, this is one heavily oxidized base. The first thing I will do is remove the old cap wheels. To do this, I use a scalpel and wedge it between the cap and the base and twist. If done right, it will fire across the room never to be found again. With the wheels removed, I will first wash the base, then use the electro polisher to remove the oxidation. Here you can see how it looked after the polisher was done with it. I went ahead and took the liberty of putting in the tail lights with a red sharpie. Now that the base is nice and shiny, I can put on the new cap wheels, which are just snapped on. After the new wheels are on, I can spend some time carefully bending the axles back into their proper shape. The last original part to work on is the interior plastic. The first thing I do is remove the dirt and pink paint. Here the paint was easy to remove as it didn't adhere to the plastic and was removed with soap and water. Normally cleaning the plastic is all that is required, but this interior has been bent due to the car being crushed. To get it back into shape, I will heat it with a hair dryer off camera and then bend the plastic back to where it should be. The plastic is very soft and doesn't need much heat to move it around. With the interior fixed, I can now put the car back together. The windshield and plastic hood fit fine without any issue. However, normally I have to heat the plastic of these repo parts for the perfect fit. So just know if you buy these parts and they don't fit perfectly, you need to heat them with a hair dryer and press them into place. Alright, I would like to thank subscriber Speedy for sending me this car. It's not the only bifocal that has been sent to me to restore, but it definitely was the most destroyed. I am trying to get caught up on all my subscriber cars that have been sent to me, so if you have sent a car, you might see it soon. This particular car turned out a lot nicer than I would have expected it to when I first started working on it. Uh, that being said, it still has some imperfections like pitting that I couldn't remove, and it also has some issues rolling as the original wheel bases have so many chips out of them. As always, I am curious what your thoughts are, so please leave a comment below. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time.